I am Elaine Fain. I am proud to be a member of the board of the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities and co-chair of this year's celebration. I'd like to welcome all of you to my home here in Providence, whether you've attended a prior celebration or whether this is your first time, and especially to you folks who are cheering a favorite honoree. Welcome from near and from far. And never would I have thought that I'd be speaking to you from my home rather than socializing with you at a live event. But innovation and creativity move us on even in these most, most difficult times. A special thanks to our event committee, our board and our staff for their dedicated support. And of course, congratulations to our amazing honorees. Thanks again for coming, and now for Tiffany. Thanks, Elaine. I'm Tiffany Bowers. I'm vice board chair and co-chair of this year's celebration. I'm so excited that you're here and to celebrate this year's honorees. The pandemic and actions for social change have highlighted the need to mobilize the humanities in our communities. The humanities are so important. They allow us the time and space to connect with each other and to share our diverse perspectives so we can all work together towards solutions. Thanks to all of our sponsors this year for helping to make the program possible. You'll see them recognized throughout the show and in the digital program book. Again, thank you for joining us. Now, on with the show. This year's honorees reflect how the humanities can help us advance equity and create a sense of belonging. Congratulations to Dr. Joyce Stevos, Mary Beth Meehan, Providence Clemente Veterans Initiative, and Jenea Kizzi. Thank you for your service in our classrooms, in the media, with our veterans, in our libraries. Every day you'll help expand our shared understanding, thereby strengthening our community. Your work and the work of the Rhode Island Council of the Humanities is more important now than ever. During this time of pandemic, the humanities offer us a way to reaffirm our shared humanity and seek inspiration from previous generations that have overcome challenges and terrible loss. The humanities give us hope that we can weather the storm, that we can meet this moment, and that we can find a way forward and emerge stronger and more united. That is why I keep fighting for more resources for the National Endowment for Humanities that helps you do this vital work. But thank you very much for what you've done. Thank you to the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities for all your terrific work helping us recognize and explain to the world what a wonderful, vibrant, and distinctive place Rhode Island is. In fact, you actually help make Rhode Island a vibrant and distinctive place. I want to congratulate the honorees for this year's celebration. Teachers, photographers, librarians, artists, so much more. You all help bring Rhode Island's wonderful story to life. <clears throat> and this is especially important now. The honorees, Dr. Joyce L. Stevos, educator and civic leader, Mary Beth Meehan, Pulitzer-nominated photographer, educator, and writer, the Providence Clemente Veterans Initiative, a great program for veterans to help them explore history, art, philosophy, and literature, and Janaya Kizzi, archivist, librarian, artist, and writer. You all are doing wonderful things, and it is great that the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities is there to recognize you. Very best wishes and congratulations, everyone. Thank you. As we mark National Arts and Humanities Month, I join the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities in recognizing the immense contributions to culture, history, education, and civic engagement of the local humanities leaders and organizations being honored today. I firmly believe that Rhode Island is an incredible place to live, visit, work, and call home because of your passionate service. So I'd like to congratulate Dr. Joyce Stevos, who's receiving the Honorary Chairs Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Humanities. Mary Beth Meehan, who's receiving the Tom Roberts Prize for Creative Achievement in the Humanities. And the Providence Clemente Veterans Initiative, which is receiving the Innovation in the Humanities Award. And Janiah Kizzi, who's receiving the Public Humanities Scholar Award. Your recognition by the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities this evening is well-deserved, and there is no 
doubt your work adds to the Ocean State's strength and vibrancy. Again, on behalf of all the people of Rhode Island, I thank you all for your dedication to our state. Congratulations. Thank you to the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities for organizing this event and for your tireless efforts to support and strengthen public history, cultural heritage, civic education, and community engagement. As the sole dedicated source of funding for public humanities in our state, the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities has played a critical role in bringing Rhode Island's stories to life and amplifying the diverse voices that make this state special. And as art and cultural organizations across the country face devastation due to the COVID-19 pandemic, its mission is more important than ever. As we continue to navigate the unprecedented challenges of our time, it's important that we never leave artists and cultural organizations behind. Thank you all for all that you're doing for your incredible advocacy. It's essential and I am proud and grateful to have such strong partners in this important work. It's because of organizations such as the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities that we can remain connected even while we're socially distant. I know that these last few months have been really difficult on folks. Folks have been isolated and they've been apart from the folks that give them sustenance and their loved ones. That's why more than ever, we have to rely on and support the arts and the humanities because the humanities have a way and have a power to bring us together like so few other things do. It allows us to share our unique experiences that truly transcend distance and other boundaries. Thank you for giving us that sustenance and for embedding the arts and humanities into the DNA of our city. Congratulations on another year of success, and I look, for, I look forward to working together for our community with a deeper commitment to the arts and the humanities. The Council for the Humanities is important because it fosters the telling of stories, not just some people's stories, but all of our stories. And when we know more about our neighbors, where they came from, what we're doing here now, it helps us imagine where we might go. I see the Humanity Council's impact in our community here at Trinity Rep, where we program our work in response to the world around us. The Rhode Island Council for the Humanities has supported Tomaquag Museum in the creation of exhibits, literary projects, and recently the First People's Road Tour. To me, a Humanities Council is a body that recognizes the importance of connecting humanitarian values of diverse organizations so we can bring cultural awareness in this fast-paced urban world. Because of your help, we've been able to stay creative and connected even during this really challenging time. I'm so grateful that the council celebrated me, not just for being an actor or attempting to make a difference in my community, but more importantly, doing it through being a teacher. The major grant the council gave us this spring enabled us to change gears really quickly when COVID hit and add this really interesting outdoor component to our women's history project. The council has been really important in my own work as a storyteller here in the state of Rhode Island. I've been able to do some research on black folks right here and develop some stories which has been really exciting for me. It's also been vital to the work of the Rhode Island Black Storytellers. The Rhode Island Council for the Humanities has supported us in the creation of new exhibits and virtual programs that share our Indigenous stories from a first-person perspective, like our new Warrior Women exhibit, honoring local and national figures, women that have inspired other women like me. I see the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities impacts to RILA in many ways, but most importantly it was through the grant funds that they provided to Nuestra Raices throughout the years. The funds have expanded our project, which have allowed us to have open and critical conversations among Latino families and community members. You'd be hard pressed to find a more dedicated group of people than the staff at the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities. We are so happy, so grateful to be working in a state that has such a hardworking and dedicated council um, and to see that dedication present in all of the programs and the organizations like our own that the Humanities Council works to uplift and support is always inspiring, so thank you. Thank you, Rich, for supporting IARA and its endeavors. Namaste. Thank you, Humanities Council. Thank you for everything. Katabatash, thank you, Rhode Island Council on the Humanities. Cheers to the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities for all that you do to engage us in history, the arts, education, and civic engagement. 
Welcome to the first ever virtual celebration of the humanities. I miss seeing you all in person, I really do. But welcome to my flat on the west side of Providence from what I imagine to be living rooms all across Rhode Island and maybe even beyond. I've been truly inspired by the creativity and the adaptability of Rhode Island's humanities community this year. The global pandemic and the movement for racial justice have challenged me deeply. They've made me question my complacency about common ground across differences and that the humanities naturally and inevitably create those bridges. Engaging history and culture, I have found, is not just about reflection and understanding, but about action. The change that we want to be and that we want to make depends upon acknowledging oppression, negotiating the contradictions between cherished ideals and the realities of inequality and injustice. We also need to confront our own culpabilities. Creating a better future also means recognizing the leadership and hard-won achievements of those who came before us, and that is in many ways what brings us together tonight. Restoring histories that have been suppressed and engaging in difficult dialogues brings us proximate to each other, even as we recognize differences and change the narrative that enforces inequality stemming the erosion of civil society and building it anew is a responsibility that we all bear. These are what the humanities can do and what the Humanities Council has dedicated itself to working toward. I want to take a moment to thank our congressional delegation, Senator Reid, Senator Whitehouse, Congressman Cicilline and Congressman Langevin, for their steadfast support and advocacy for the humanities. Thanks to the CARES Act, the Humanities Council, through the National Endowment for the Humanities, was able to distribute close to $380,000 in relief grants to 65 organizations in Rhode Island. This is in addition to our regular grant making of close to $170,000 to 30 project grants to support organizations researchers, and filmmakers. Thank you also to our sponsors of tonight's event who you can find listed in the digital program book. We truly appreciate your support and partnership in ensuring that the council can deliver on its mission to seed, support, and strengthen the humanities by and for all Rhode Islanders. Now, I'm so excited to offer you a unique glimpse into the work and impact of this year's honorees, each of whom lead through their dedication, their creativity, their innovation, and their scholarship. We were reading philosophy this past January, I believe it was, and we were reading existentialism. How do you find meaning in life when you have doubt, at least, about the existence of God? And for whatever reason, that particular night, several of the vets who were often very quiet in class um, did these readings and, and, and really opened up um, in class. It just connected with them about some of their own experiences, their thoughts of, in some cases, thoughts of, of suicide. Um, you know, we all know that, that far too many veterans commit suicide on a daily basis. Um, many, many more have thought about it. Um, you know, what, what do you do with that thought? Um, you know, therapy is something you can do. But studying the humanities with others who have a sense of what you're talking about and have some of the same sorts of experiences is yet another way of, of doing something about it. My name is Mark Santow. I'm the academic director of the Providence Clemente Veterans Initiative. Rhode Island has a higher percentage of its National Guard that's been deployed in Iraq and Afghanistan than any other state in the country. So we have a, a very, we're a little place, but we have a very large percentage of uh, veterans um, all over the place. Uh, you know, and if we're talking about National Guard, we're talking about, you know, ordinary folks throughout the community, right? People who didn't make a life out of being in the military necessarily. Um, who've had the experience of, of service and combat 
but nonetheless come home to a country where the overwhelming majority of their peers do not have that experience. One of the things that studying the humanities, meaning literature, history, art, uh, and philosophy in particular for our course, um, is that a lot of what veterans feel, think, and experience is um, universal across time and across culture. So there's a universality to it. Uh, when a veteran explores the humanities, they feel a little bit less alone um, than they may have in the past. And, you know, as a teacher, that's all you really want is to help give people tools to make meaningful sense of their own lives. It's now my pleasure to present the Innovation in the Humanities Award to the Providence Clemente Veterans Initiative. The Innovation Award recognizes the innovative implementation of the humanities by an organization or a collaborative partnership between organizations to achieve a specific goal. The Providence Clemente Veterans Initiative, or PCVI, which is how um, people talk about it, offers Clemente Humanities courses each year on the campus of Trinity Repertory Theater in downtown Providence, though of course the class is being offered virtually now. Supported by a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the course is open to all veterans, regardless of discharge status, age, or education. All materials are provided free of charge, and childcare and transportation are available to those who need it. Those who complete the PCVI are eligible to earn up to six credits from Bard College, which they can transfer to any university in the country. Uh, and did I mention that it's a free course? It is. Um, so students explore history, philosophy, art, and literature from the ancient Greeks to the present and work with professors from UMass Dartmouth, from the University of Rhode Island, and the Rhode Island School of Design, as well as guest scholars, filmmakers, and Trinity Rep actors. Dr. Mark Santow, Associate Professor and Chair of History at UMass Dartmouth and a Providence School Board member, directs the program. The PCBI works closely with its partners, Operation Stand Down, Rhode Island, Trinity Rep, and the URI College of Arts and Sciences to recruit and support students. And so now I'd like to turn things over to Tyrone Smith, uh, who is an alum of the PCVI. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, along with Elizabeth Francis, it's an honor to present this award uh, to Providence Clemente Veterans Initiative. Um, like Elizabeth said, my name is Tyrone Smith. I spent six and a half years in the military as an MP, a military policeman. Um, during that time, uh, went all over the world, um, but uh, culminated with a combat experience, um, a, a deployment to Baghdad. So when I came back from uh, Baghdad in 2009, I transitioned into being a civilian, uh, started going to school. So uh, for me, that college experience was quite different than what the military was. When I look to the left and you look to the right. Um, you don't see your, your comrades, your, your life experiences is uh, quite different. Um, my peers seem to be a little bit more advanced, a little bit more on their game. Um, we were diverse, but not at the same time. Um, but so I eventually gained steam uh, in the academic community. I found my place. I was able to uh, graduate with an English degree uh, from college. Um, so when I graduated in 2015, I immediately started working with veterans. And in 2018, I started my position here at Operation Stand Down, where I'm the Director of Employment and Housing. Um, Mark had contacted me uh, a few years ago. Uh, he, he gave me a phone call and we had a conference call with the team here. And the purpose of that call was to let him know what we do and for him to let us know about PCVI, Providence, Providence Clemente Veterans Initiative. So over the course of the meeting, you know, we let them know that the most important thing that, that we do here is workforce development in the employment realm. Um, and as many of you know, workforce development is, is education is key to that. 
So uh, before we sent veterans to PCVI, I wanted to take the course. And I convinced a colleague of mine here to, that has never been to college to take the course with me. Um, so I am an alum of the course. And over the, the uh, semester that we took it, it's now two semesters, but over that semester, um, we created an incredible bond. Um, we are sharing our stories we're, while we're discussing relevant topics, um, current events, um, but all through the lens of the humanities. Um, but what's unique about PCVI is, is having multiple faculty members teach their specific area of study, being able to look to the left and right and see your comrades um, that span a variety of ages um, and different time periods, different services, um, and all tying it together to create the bond between not only us, the veterans in the room, but the faculty. Um, and overall, you know, there has been times when we look around and everybody can tell there's just that magic moment where you could only produce that in a PCVI type environment. So, you know, overall, uh, amazing program. I'm happy to be continue to be involved with PCVI as a teaching assistant. And, um, and that's it. Along with Elizabeth Francis and Tyrone Smith, it is an honor to present this award to the Providence Clemente Veterans Initiative. My name is Sarah Kavanaugh. I'm a United States Marine Corps veteran. Uh, I have been to Iraq and Afghanistan. I joined the PCVI course with Ty the initial year that it started and had not been in a formal classroom except a military institute. So being in a civilian type classroom was a different experience. I had also spent a significant amount of time rehabbing in a military treatment facility uh, before I got out. So I had not had, um, I had not been in the normal world for quite some time. <laughs> So I actually went to a book reading, a Tim O'Brien book reading, and got a follow-up email about the PCVI. I was interested because it said it was an all-veterans course. Um, that drew me in immediately because I thought, if we're going to talk about things and learn about things, I want to be with people who have similar experiences to mine to make it easier to share and understand. That course did exactly that. There were multiple times when we were in the room, as Ty says, and I would say things and Ty's coworker one time said, I read the articles and I think about all of the readings and I think I've thought about it each and every way. And then you say something and I realize I didn't think about it that way. And there were these moments several times during the course I took where male veterans would turn to me and say, I hadn't thought about it that way. I didn't understand how different your experience was. And that was incredibly empowering for me as a female veteran because often sometimes you can be overlooked um, and also be overlooked by your military counterparts. So the course allowed me visibility to share my experience, validation in front of other veterans, and also the tools through the text, particularly philosophy, the Tim O'Brien and some of the historical Greek readings to reflect in a productive way that allowed me to process my own experience while also processing academic information. And produce assignments that I was proud to share and in, engage in conversation with other veterans during the course and the professors that where I normally wouldn't have. I normally wouldn't have had that confidence and that ability to share the way I did. So I've come back. This is going to be my second year teaching with Ty as a teacher's assistant, um, which is a whole another challenge but I, that I love. Um, something I lost when I left the Marine Corps was my, my general purpose, right? We go, 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 and then you get out and you have a lot of time to fill. And so the PCBI, particularly teaching it, challenges me to think about the text in a way and digest it to make it easier and understandable for other veterans to read it. Um, and also give them the confidence that PCBI allowed me to develop and prepare them to go to school or move forward in any other course they wish to take. So I'm very grateful for my experience there. Well, Mark, along with Tyrone and Sarah, it's my honor to present 
the PCBI with the Innovation in the Humanities Award in 2020. Thank you, everybody. You can see the award here. <laughs> Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Um, and I am incredibly honored and, and grateful to accept uh, this award and to, to do it in the company of my my colleagues and my friends, Ty and Sarah. Um, you know, Ty and Sarah, as I mentioned, were, were students in the very first course in spring of 2019 after we got our first first NEH grant. Um, and uh, in the second grant, which is funded the last year and this upcoming year, um, really, to be honest, thinking specifically of Ty and Sarah, I wrote into that grant that I wanted uh, a line item in the budget to fund what is called a dialogues facilitator, which in common English is a teaching assistant. Um, but what Ty and Sarah do, in fact, is, is much, much more than that. Um, you know, they are liaisons between the faculty and the veterans. They help us craft the curriculum. Um, you know, what, what readings and works of art resonate with students and, and which ones don't. Um, you know, they're faculty members as much as they are students. So um, I'm particularly honored to, to accept this award in, in, in their presence here. Um, I also want to accept it on behalf of my amazing PCVI faculty colleagues, uh, Jen Riley, Cheryl Foster, and Kathleen Torrens of University of Rhode Island, and Susan Scanlon of the Rhode Island School of Design. Um, but this award also honors the work of our scholar veterans, too, uh, who have bravely shaped, shared their stories, spread the word, and reminded my colleagues and I of the extraordinary power engagement with the humanities can have uh, to help us find meaning and self-understanding and community. Um, you know, this is an award for them as much as it is for us. You know, I've been a college professor for a long time, um, and that tends to be a you know professor at the front and students in their seats, and it's you know much much of what goes on in the room comes from the professor. Um, that's not what this is. Uh, this is something we make collectively together, which is really the best of what engagement with the humanities can be. Um, and, and the best way I can measure that is to tell you that it has been as much a learning experience, a meaningful experience for me as it's been, I think, for any of the students who participated. Um, thanks to the opportunities that have been provided to me over the years by Leela Hilton, James Shores, and the Clemente course in the humanities, I have never been more convinced of the value of this, of this work. Um, through the humanities, we're able to connect the particular to the universal, the individual to the community, and our personal experiences to the civic realm of our common, common governance. Uh, Marcel Proust once said that we don't travel in order to see new places, we travel to see old places in new ways. And engagement with the humanities, to me, is, is like that uh, for us as individuals and as a community. Uh, in a time when disease and division seem to be straining the threads that hold us together as Americans and raising fundamental questions about what we owe to one another, uh, we need the humanities more than ever uh, in our schools, at all levels, uh, in our political discourse, and in the daily ways we seek to live and examine life as human beings. I think our work here in the Providence Clemente Veterans Initiative makes clear that this work has been extremely valuable for veterans in particular, many of whom, like Sarah and Ty, have confronted questions of obligation, meaning, and mortality in the most direct, visceral, and existentially challenging of ways, often at very young ages. Uh, but these are, in the end, fundamentally human questions, and the humanities can help us answer them. Uh, but perhaps more importantly, they challenge us to ask those questions in the first place. Um, so I really want to thank uh, everyone here, every student who's participated uh, for uh, for this award. Um, it's a it's a remarkable thing, and um, you know I ask all of you here in the Prov the larger Providence and Rhode Island humanities community, uh, you know, to to work with us, share ideas, and help us keep this going in the future. So thank you very much. Thanks to Elizabeth. Well, thank you. Um, it's uh, great to hear um, all of your perspectives, uh, Mark, Sarah, and Ty. I, um, I thank you and um, 
I want to congratulate you again. Um, congratulations on the Innovation Award to the Providence Clemente Veterans Initiative. When I was really little, I had an uncle who was living in New York, studying to be a filmmaker, and he started sending me photo books. And I would look at these books and I just spent so much time with the pictures. I just became really transfixed with a still image and the people in them and thinking about those people in their lives and how that image always remained the same. I could keep returning to it and seeing new things in that tiny slice of that person's life. My name is Mary Beth Meehan, and I'm a photographer and a writer and a teacher here in Providence. The first time I made a public installation, when the, when the body of work was done, I was thinking about how to show it. And it just became instantly clear to me that to take that work and show it in the white cube or in the white, upper white, middle class museum world or gallery world was totally kind of against the point of the work, you can't interact with this work in the white cube. You have to walk them in down the streets and you have to be with the people who are living there in order to think about how you think about them. Wonton St. Louis was a, a man that I made a portrait of in Providence and he became a friend. Years ago, I photographed him in the 90s and I was sort of thinking like, what impact do these banners having? Like, are they having any impact? Are they just nice pictures? His daughter Shebna, who'd been a little girl when I met them, um, we started corresponding and she said, Mary Beth, you don't get it about this picture. You have made an image of my father that approximates how we see him as this dignified, well-dressed man of honor, a, a leader in our community. I inhabit the position of the white American, you know? So, so I can't ever know what other people's experience is, but I can go into these relationships and I can try to make work that is, is, is met where people want to be met and, and, and meets them on their own terms. They don't change policy. They don't tear down racist institutions. But I think they open people's hearts. I think they have cracked open possibility for connections. If I make work that's authentic to the people, authentic to the community, that really does address what the community needs or what I sense could be beneficial to the community or what I'm, what I'm told could be beneficial to the community, then the impact will be the natural outcome of that. Well, hello again, it is my pleasure to present the Tom Roberts Prize for Creative Achievement in the Humanities to Mary Beth Meehan. The Tom Roberts Prize celebrates creativity in topics, disciplines, and formats that extend the field of the humanities. This year's prize honors Mary Beth Meehan, a photographer, writer, and educator with degrees from Amherst College and the University of Missouri who has spent more than two decades embedding herself in communities across the United States in creating long-term documentary projects. Her work combines image, text, and large-scale public installation to question notions of identity, visibility, and equity in communities. Mian's portrait banners activate public spaces and spark conversations among the people who inhabit them. Her seen unseen portrait series in downtown Providence encourages viewers to see both differences and commonality and places people at the center of the experience of the city. Meehan's Seeing Noonan project in Georgia sparked a nationwide dialogue about immigration when it was featured on the front page of the New York, Sunday New York Times in January this past 2020. Mian has exhibited her work, given lectures, and held academic res residencies nationally and internationally. She was nominated twice for the Pulitzer Prize and has spent over a decade teaching students in bilingual classrooms at the International Charter School in Pawtucket, 
to creatively explore their own cultural identities. Her first book, Silicon Valley and the New America with Fred Turner is forthcoming from the University of Chicago Press. And now I'd like to turn things over to Bernadette Pitts Wiley, who will say a few words about her work with Mary Beth. Okay. Um, as noted, I'm Bernadette Pitts Wiley, uh, the co-founder of Mixed Magic Theater, um, a poet and actress, and I also work as a diversity and inclusion consultant, and um, enjoy, have a passion for education, the arts, advocating for those things, health, uh, children. And um, my engagement with Mary Beth began actually before I even met her. I realized now uh, it was at a time that we were looking, when I say we, I mean the Mixed Magic Theater was looking for a photographer and I had heard some wonderful things about her and uh, I had wanted to, um, to engage her, but for whatever reasons that never happened. But when I did uh, find out about her, it was, um, within the framework she was looking for subject matter for the unseen you know project and apparently had gone to the church uh, where my mother uh, goes and was looking for someone uh, you know um, to be a subject and my mother as it turned out was the person that the pastor introduced her to and I guess after a little uh, uh, some time um, my mother warmed up and they ended up doing the portrait, the beautiful, wonderful portrait that we see downtown now. Um, but the things that make Mary Beth special is the way that she engages the world that's around her. You know, it's like with these new eyes and things. And uh, she has this, this energy that just kind of like immediately involves you. So it's been a terrific um growing of friendship, I would say. And I think it really uh, came to height for both of us uh, when, during the Providence Fest uh, in 2018. And when they actually hung, you know, I, I called her to find out when they were going to hang it and all of that. And she actually went down there in the rain and told me they were hanging it and then, you know, the cheers went up. And uh, thereafter, um, we planned a reception for my mom. And we didn't even know that she was going to come. She was that type of person. You know, she had her own ways about her and some things she just didn't do. So she told us that she'd maybe be there, maybe she wouldn't, okay? But as it turned out, she did turn out and uh, many of her friends turned out and Mary Beth brought friends and it turned into the most beautiful, beautiful, reception and party. My mother's friends were like so, oh my God, over, overwhelmed in a joyful way. You know, uh, Annie Ray Pitts, you know, is on the wall in downtown Providence. And uh, that was just like such a wonderful um, uh, honor, you know, for my mother. Uh, I will say this, my mother, was well known in the neighborhood, I mean, in the community for the things that she, you know, she was doing. Uh, I, I mean, she was a gospel singer, but she also was very involved in the education of, you know, um, young people. She sat on boards and things, even though all of her kids and grandkids were out of school, she was that type of person. She was there. She did the first AIDS project, uh, Extravaganza back in the 80s, you know, when it first came out. So she was always involved in the community. So to see her so honored, uh, it was just absolutely wonderful. And I want to say this, for a woman who had migrated from the South, because she came from um, uh, Alabama in the hopes of a better life for her children. And she did that. And I honor her, you know, for the courage that it took for the absolute courage because there were five of us at the time and um, we have done, all done okay. And uh, so it's with that kind of honor that I um, take because Mary Beth was able to kind of put this up on the wall and we are able to see it whenever we go down there. We are reminded of who she was, what she was, how she did things. 
and she has a millions of people that feel that way about her, especially what we call her church children. In fact, a lot of them uh, participate at Mixed Magic from time to time. You know, these are people that she has touched their lives in some way because she is, a, again, a passionate advocate for education, for history, uh, for helping people, you know, and uh, she passed that on to many of us. And uh, so Mary Beth has helped us honor her in that way. And I am so glad that she is receiving this reward because she is so deserving so absolutely deserving. Not just my mother, the other uh, photographs that are placed, you know, in places downtown or were placed in places. It was just, you know, these communities that you brought a life to, you know, they weren't the them or these people over there. These people became the same people. And, you know, it's it's been wonderful. It's been a wonderful journey. And, well, thank you, Bernadette and Mary Beth. The Humanities Council is very pleased and proud to honor you with the Tom, Tom Roberts Prize for Creative Achievement in the Humanities. Well, I can't thank you enough, Elizabeth, and I can't thank you enough, Bernadette. And I'm just here laughing because it was sort of a lot, it's a, been a long and ongoing journey with your mom. And I just wanted <laughs> to say, I can't wait to talk about that a little bit. I just want to. You know, when I think about the Rhode Island, this beautiful award it's that's beautiful. here in my office with me, this handmade gorgeous glass piece of art, um, I think about Elizabeth Francis and the, and the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities and for how many years you've supported these projects of mine. And it, it feels like one of the gems of Rhode Island that we can, those of us who are trying to tell stories and do this work that sometimes has no form or reason, we can go to the council and get um, advice about how to shape those ideas and know that we'll get the kind of support both financially and within the community that we need to get these things off the ground. So I just can't thank you enough and the council. And Bernadette, you know, your mom became a really, really dear friend of mine. And so it's a huge honor to have you here. And um, since she passed away, you know, Ber uh, Bernadette's son, Jonathan, had an interest in photography. And he came to me and said, my grandmother's passed away. And it's something I always wanted to do. Could we talk about photography together? And so our friendship is just enlarging itself over over the course of generations and um, this work has just brought these people into my life that I am so enriched to know and love and so I just am really moved by this whole by this whole moment so thank you all so much so deserving thank you Thank you. And I look forward, Bernadette, to, to more to more work, more storytelling work together as we as we as the years go on. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank well, you. Thank you both. And thank you all. Um, congratulations, Mary Beth, on a very congratulations. good award. Thank you very, very much. And it could not, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. So we, we, we do these things together. You know, we're all interconnected. So thank you all. And with lots of love and with lots of love to all the other recipients. Thank you very much. My name is Ben Jagir and I am the head designer here at Gather Glass. Gather Glass has been part of Rich for, let's say, about nine years, and uh, we've been creating the awards that are given out annually. We feel very proud of everyone that has received them in the past and absolutely love working with, with Rich. The glass itself is about 2,000 degrees, okay? So as soon as we come out, it's cooling. So we don't have much time. So you gotta kinda have a game plan to work with this stuff. The basis of our studio is teaching. It all kind of revolves back to our roots of who we are, which is gather, which is really gathering the community together. I think it's important to keep the fabric of our community tight and look out for each other. Rich is extremely important for the community, not just in Providence or surrounding communities, but the entire state. 
the feeling I get when I create these pieces is, you know, I do a little research on the recipients and understanding where they're going. And uh, I have a lot of pride in what I do and the chance, even if it's a small chance, for me to get to share what I'm so proud of doing with these people that they're so proud of. I think it's a full circle. I just wanted to congratulate all the recipients this year. Uh, I was very excited when I was asked to make the award once again. And uh, I just am so grateful that there is people out there pushing kindness and we need it more and more every day. And thank you. And I hope when you look at your award, you can realize some of your achievements and power on through these tough times and then keep on moving. I'm extremely honored. I will continue to do it every year they continue to ask me. When we talk about history and making history and living through history, it's important to carry our own stories um, in the way that we want them to be carried. So it doesn't, it doesn't have to be in statistics and it doesn't have to be in black and white photographs and it doesn't have to be um, in, in, a, in a diary that is beautifully handwritten. It just has to be in our own context and the way we want to tell our stories. My name is Janae Kizzy. I am a librarian, an archivist, a writer, and an artist. I talk about myself as a Providence and Rhode Island superfan. So I do a lot of things, but most of what I do is because um, I love being here. I find myself drawn toward places where I can, I can help people gather and, and be in a community. So in 2019, I saw that the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities was looking for the Rhode Island Arts and Culture Fellow. The idea behind the fellowship was to raise public consciousness of the Rhode Island and arts and culture landscape. And to do that, they wanted to have it done in a very public forum. So they thought, why not Wikipedia? It has an immediate connection with the public. When people are looking up things about Rhode Island, it comes up immediately on Google. Rhode Island could still use more representation on Wikipedia. We have nationally and internationally significant artists. In living in the state, influenced by the work being done in the state, one of the most important things for me in the fellowship was not focusing on the, the traditional ways of looking at arts and culture. And part of that is diverse voices, um, different ethnicities, just just looking beyond what one would normally see on Wikipedia in archives um, and and starting to look at the extremely rich populations and communities that are that make up this place places where the past and and the present and sometimes the future meet on a weirdly synchronous razor edge are really beautiful to me um, moments that that mirror each other throughout time. Um, they, to get very sci-fi about it, they, they feel like wormholes. They feel like connections, very, very solid roads where we can actually see and feel the past within ourselves. Um, and, I, and I love to write about that. I love to make art about it. I like to, um, to push at the, the boundaries between how, how we experience this moment and, and how every, every person who came before us experienced their own moments. Well, it's now my, my privilege and pleasure to present the Public Humanities Scholar Award to Jenea Kizzy. The Scholar Award recognizes outstanding public humanities work in teaching and scholarship that advances the civic and cultural life of Rhode Island. This year's award honors Janea Kizzy for her unflinching dedication to equity, access, and engagement in the public humanities in institutions and in digital spaces. Janea earned her undergraduate degree in creative writing and history at Bard College. Following work as an archives assistant at the Seely G. Mudd Manuscript Library at Princeton, 
she was awarded a PRISM scholarship to pursue a master's degree at the University of Rhode Island focused on library services and information literacy for underserved populations. She then assisted in, es in establishing the archives at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences in Cambridge, um, and also worked with Citizens Bank, Concord Free Library, and uh, on their archives, and most recently, organized the AS220 collection at Providence Public Library in 2018. Kizzy was named the Rhode Island Arts and Culture Research Fellow for the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities in 2019, and in 2020 began a new role at the Providence Public Library as their events coordinator focused on engaging the public with the library's extensive collections and resources. Jenea is also an artist, and a writer. She was co-director of Frequency Writers in 2015 and 2016, and her work has appeared at Fringe Providence, the RISD Museum, and Creature Conserves Urban Wildlife Exhibit. So um, to talk a little bit more about uh, Jenea's work, I, I'd like to turn things over to Christina Bevilacqua, who is herself uh, an award winner of the Tom, Robert, Tom Roberts Prize a few years ago. Christina. Thank you, Elizabeth. Um, I'm Christina Babalacqua, and I'm the Programs and Exhibitions Director at Providence Public Library. It's an honor and a great pleasure to join Elizabeth Francis in presenting this award to Jenea Kizzy. One of the happiest days of my career came last December when I learned that Jenea had applied for PPL's new events coordinator position. I knew that not only would PPL be getting someone with proven expertise at organizing information and making it useful and understandable to the public, which we very much needed for our newly renovated building filled with new public spaces, but also that I would get to work directly with one of the most creative, thoughtful, visionary people in all of Providence, to make PPL's new programs literally and metaphorically accessible to everyone in our city and state. I consider myself so very lucky to work with her. As it happened, our literal building could not literally reopen due to the pandemic. And it was during the test of this spring that I came to fully appreciate with awe Jenea's unique combination of skills. When we realized that our planned program season would have to be postponed, she accepted the challenge of producing varied, multi-form, artist-driven programs virtually, something we had never done before. And her contributions were not add-ons or translations from IRL to the virtual. As she described them, these programs were born COVID and born virtual. Her ability to think in original, groundbreaking ways about how to communicate information and create experiences in this brave new world was exciting and heartening for everyone who worked with her, as well as for those who attended and participated. I'm not the only one who considers myself lucky to work with her. Her decade plus history at PPL includes work as an intern, a volunteer, and an archivist. She is known and beloved by everyone throughout the library. When we announced her hiring at a staff meeting in January, everyone cheered and cheered. Jenea has the rigor of an archivist, the imagination of a poet, the passion of an activist, the tender attention of a mother. She listens better than anyone I know and analyzes data of every kind to arrive at elegant, exciting, inspiring solutions. She is a scholar in every sense and a gift to this community, especially at a moment when understanding and communication across sectors and borders are so needed. I think I thank her for all she's brought and I can't wait to see all that lies ahead for her. Congratulations, my friend. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Christina. Um, and thank you, Elizabeth. My yeah. deepest gratitude, thank you. Um, and my deepest gratitude to the selection committee, the board and the staff of the council. Um, I, I sincerely wish that I had time to be humble um, or to thank all of the people who have lifted me up over my career um, or to even take a moment to be salty about the divisions in the world of public humanities. Um, but we have more pressing matters. 
Um, black people are systemically being murdered and oppressed and change reparations and healing cannot take place until we in the humanities truly acknowledge our complicity in these violent acts who are gatekeeping, erasure, and outright racism. Take a genuine risk, give up your power, listen, and believe us. We are complicit in the murders of these people. Dijon Kizzy, Damian Daniels, Anthony McLean, Julian Lewis, Maurice Absid Wagner, Rashard Brooks, Priscilla Slater, Robert Forbes, Kamal Flowers, Jamel Floyd, Dave McAtee, James Skurlock, Calvin Horton, Tony McDade, Dion Johnson, George Floyd, Maurice Gordon, Cornelius Fredericks, Stephen Taylor, Danielle Prude, Brianna Taylor, Elijah McLean, and more. Black Lives Matter, Black trans people exist, Black trans lives matter. Thank you. Thank you, Jenea. And I just, I'm just pausing to just absorb what you said. Um, and I really um, uh, want to thank you for your generosity. Uh, and also to offer our congratulations again for your amazing work. Uh, so thank you everyone and congratulations, Jenea. One of the problems that we have right now is we stopped teaching civic education. We stopped making sure that everyone understands something about United States history. How can you participate in the government if you don't know how it works? How can you participate if you don't know how, how important it is to know how it works? I'm Joyce Stevos. And at the moment, I'm an adjunct professor at Rhode Island College, where I teach students who are preparing to go into education. Um, and the course that I teach is about social justice issues that, in a sense, prepares them for, um, for teaching in public schools, mostly, that have a high number of uh, students of color, young people, understand what they're talking about, what they want. When we see so many of the young people that are saying Black Lives Matter and are marching and are protesting, they're talking about decolonizing history. And I think that the adults who are delivering education are going to have to twist their minds to understand um, what's being asked for them to deliver. It's been important for me to see things from a young person's eyes. One example is having the opportunity to work with people to develop the Trinity Academy for the Performing Arts. It's a place where everybody likes to be, wants to be there. The humanities make um, learning so much fun for young people. I don't think about legacy. I, I mean, that, that to me sounds phony. I think about making a difference. I think I read a Pew report that um, all kids from the start of about nine years old uh, want to make a difference in the world. And you, you continue. And I think that I, I continue to try to make a difference. It's now my distinct pleasure and honor to present the Honorary Chairs Award for Lifetime Achievement in the Humanities to Dr. Joyce Stevos. This award celebrates career achievements that demonstrate humanities excellence, reflect the Council's mission and core values, and enrich public life in Rhode Island. Dr. Stevos is a Rhode Island native and graduate of Classical High School, Rhode Island College, and the University of Rhode Island. An adjunct professor in educational studies at Rhode Island College now, 
Dr. Stevos was a teacher and administrator in the Providence Public Schools, where she was a leader in implementing the study of Black history, the Holocaust, the Armenian genocide, and law-related education. After retirement, she served as a consultant with Trinity Restoration, Inc. to develop and incorporate the Trinity Academy for the Performing Arts Charter School. And that opened in 2009. Dr. Stevos has been a very strong community volunteer. She has served on the boards of several community organizations. She was a founding member, member of the Rhode Island Black Heritage Society and is a member and past regent of the Narragansett Cook Gaspi Charter of the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution. And she is currently a board member of the Rhode Island Heritage Hall of Fame and the Heritage Harbor Foundation. And now I'm gonna turn things over to Rose Weaver. Yes, indeed. I am so honored to be invited to be a part of honoring Joyce um, along with you, Miss Elizabeth Francis. You know, I remember Joyce from way, way back. In fact, I remember sitting in a, in a meeting at the school department years ago, and I, I can't remember the exact date, Joyce, but your dream of having a performing arts school came out in that meeting. And shortly after that, unfortunately, I, unfortunately too, I moved to California, but I remember that really clearly, your enthusiasm. Um, and it, it was always, for you, it seemed to me that it was always about the whole community, that it, uh, I, I know you, you, you know, you were a leader in the, the quote says, implementing the study of black history and the Holocaust and some other things, Indian genocide and related education, but I remember that whatever you touched came to be was always full of your professionalism. You've always been a really incredible role model. I looked up to you. I mean, I remember, and I, I may even be older than <laughs> you, but I remember like the Black Heritage Society and all the kinds of things that we used to do under your leadership. And so for you to get this award, really, it speaks highly of, I think, how the community feels about you. I feel that way about you. And I just wanna say congratulations from the bottom of my heart. Well, it's never easy to follow Rose who captures the camera and the audience always exquisitely but I'm just so happy to be here along with Elizabeth Francis and Rose Weaver to be one of the presenters for the Honorary Chair's Lifetime Achievement Award in the Humanities for Joyce. So when I first met Dr. Joyce Stevos, I was a young and dumb aspiring urban education school reformer, and she was shepherding the dream of Trinity Academy for the Performing Arts Charter School through absolutely insurmountable odds. I was an education policy rookie. I was fresh out of my first years of urban teaching and I had these dreams that I was gonna make schools better, but I had no idea how to do it. And I could not have been more fortunate to have the first person I professionally connected with here in Rhode Island be Dr. Joyce Stevos. I knew the moment I walked into Trinity Methodist Church Annex to talk to her that this woman would change the trajectory of my life. Immediately evident to me was Dr. Stevos's dedication followed closely by her intellect and her determination. Joyce was dedicated to the South Side neighborhood and the families she had seen disempowered by the public school district. She'd come up with this brilliant plan to bring education back into the neighborhood, an education that filled gaps left in public schools and celebrated families' cultures. And she was bound and determined to make it happen, even with an education establishment, saying that the whole thing was pie in the sky. Getting a new school open, is no small task. Getting a new school open that serves high poverty students of color, focusing on non-essentials like the arts, when you're a black woman and not a downtown mover and shaker, we constantly heard that it could not be done. But Joyce persisted. As the TAPA plan unfolded over the coming years, her dedication, intellect, and determination carried the day. 
using the same skills that led her to revolutionize the teaching of history to include black history, the Holocaust and the Armenian genocide, Joyce persisted doggedly to make this dream too come true. In the many years since TAPA opened, I have been blessed to continue to learn from Joyce's dedication, intellect and determination. When I was in training to become a principal, Joyce once said to me, here is my philosophy. Regardless of the impediments in my career, I am cream and I always rise to the top. It made me picture the years that Joyce had worked through unkind and unforgiving systems, butting up against racism and glass ceilings every step of the way. And I think about her holding on to that fundamental knowledge. I am the cream. I will always rise to the top. In no way was Joyce's rise preordained by the institutionally racist systems in which she moved and the sexist paradigms in which she worked. But Joyce knew. She knew her worth. She knew her value. She was dedicated, smart, and determined. And she rose. As the head of school at TAPA, a role I grew into under Joyce's mentorship, guidance, and tutelage, I know that everything I have done here was because I was boosted up onto the shoulders of a giant. It is my intention to see more and farther, not because I have a keener vision or greater height, but because I was lifted up and borne aloft by a woman who rose to the top in spite of it all again and again. Joyce, I'm awestruck, absolutely awestruck by the transformative work you have done for students of color in this city and so grateful to have joined you in the work and been part of your journey. If I can carry with me a fraction of your dedication, determination, and intellect, I will be a very fortunate woman. Thank you for all that you've done and congratulations on receiving the honorary chairs, oh, the honorary chairs achievement award for lifetime achievement in the humanities. I can't think of anyone who deserves it more. Thank you. I would like to, uh, I would, I would like to thank the Rhode Island Council for the Humanities for selecting me to receive this honor. I'm truly humbled. I have been fortunate to engage in many community activities and projects that have aligned with my and your passion for the Humanities that are a source of understanding, respecting and appreciating ourselves and our neighbors. No one achieves alone. So I am also, I am thankful for all those I have worked with for enabling me to receive this recognition. Celebrating the humanities allows us to come to the public square and exchange opinions, ideas, and understandings through civic discourse, which can bring to light our similarities and help us to resolve our differences peacefully. It provides a path for us to achieve a richer cultural understanding of one another, leading us to become a thriving community. Thank you again. Thank you, Joyce, and thank you, Rose. And and Elizabeth, I am um, really thrilled to be part of um, giving you this award. And I just wanna say again, congratulations. And thank you for everything that you've done and are continuing to do. Congratulations to Dr. Joyce Stevos. Thank you. Yay. <laughs> Well, we've come to the conclusion of the 2020 Celebration of the Humanities. Thank you for taking this break in your hectic schedules to recognize the power of the humanities in our communities as a force for change. If you've been inspired by these stories, we hope you'll share this program with your circles. Your support and partnership is integral, not only to the Humanities Council, but to Rhode Island's vibrant network of humanities organizations and practitioners, and your support of them is important as well. Thank you. 
to the co-chairs of tonight's event, Elaine Fain and Tiffany Bowers, and our tireless event committee volunteers, and especially the council's dedicated board of directors and staff. We are so grateful for the opportunity to serve Rhode Island's diverse humanities community and to amplify the important work being done by tonight's honorees and the council's many grantees and partners. Thank you for joining us and have a wonderful rest of your evening.